Welcome to Step Back History. Today, to celebrate Halloween, we're going to look at the folklore staple of the vampire. Let's look at the spooky story of how the vampire went from medieval legend to sparkly heartthrob. I am Count Tristan, and this is Spooky Step Back History. Quick content warning, this video has some discussion about death mutilation and what happens to dead bodies when they get a little ripe. Just a heads up. We suspect the origin of the vampire comes from European folklore, which believed the dead could harm the living even if buried. A lot of what we identify as vampiric comes from how bodies decompose. When you die, your skin dries out and shrinks. This makes it look as if your teeth or nails have grown longer. Your internal organs also liquefy and come out of your nose and mouth. Today we call this purge fluid. But if you didn't know what it was, you'd interpret it to be blood. If you dug up a decomposing corpse, or as I call it, cracking open a cold one, you might see a body with long teeth and blood coming out of the mouth. You could imagine why they'd consider that the basis for the image of the vampire. Vampire scares were linked to disease. Often they were triggered by plagues, and in this period, people didn't know how disease spread. Often, they'd think vampires were an evil force attacking their communities. The vampire goes back to the legend of the Revenant. Often we ascribe this to the Slavic legends of corpses that arise from the dead to attack the living, but that's only a few centuries old. The legend goes back deeper, and often, these revenants have a demonic element to them. Some claim it comes from ancient Egypt, but they seem to show up in far-off places, such as the Chinese Chong Shi, or blood-sucking deities in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So the vampire might be one of those monsters that comes from our primal fears and develop into similar creatures in different cultures. Not too long ago, a group of archaeologists unearthed a skull from 16th century Venice. They found it alongside other plague victims, but there was one thing a little strange about it. You see, this skull had a brick in its mouth. The archaeologists guessed it might have fallen on the skull over the centuries, but many more think that this was a tactic to control strega, the Italian word for vampires, and keep them from eating people. This is a common tactic for stopping a vampire. Find a way to keep the corpse from getting up again. This could mean putting heavy rocks on them or staking them down. Yeah, that's where the stake in the heart thing comes from. We sometimes hear it has to be wood, but this isn't universal. In the Middle East, for example, they thought we needed iron to contain vampires. In the Middle East, they're often conflated with jinn or westernized into genies. Containing a vampire with iron is the basis behind the containing genies with iron lamps and such. In northern Germany, vampires go by the name Noxerer, or after devourers. These vampires don't so much get up and attack the living, but cause general supernatural badness with their presence. You could tell someone was a vampire because they would chew on their burial shrouds. Again, because of purge fluid, often burial shrouds would sag or tear around the mouth, giving this illusion. Their solution feels familiar to our Italian example. It was to stop the corpse from chewing. They accomplished this by stuffing its mouth with soil and a stone or coin just to make sure. They thought that the creature would die of starvation with its mouth blocked and the curse on the town would fade. Not surprisingly, panics over these creatures erupted during plague outbreaks. Vampire scares peppered Western culture up until the scientific knowledge of disease was widespread. One of the last scares occurred in New England in the late 19th century, in the spooky town of Exeter, Rhode Island. Mercy Brown died of tuberculosis. Her mother and sister had already died, and her brother Edwin was sick. Her neighbors began to worry that the dead brown girls were what made Edwin sick. They opened Mary's grave to find she had blood in her mouth and thought, vampires! They burned Mary's heart and made the ashes into a potion for her brother to drink. Oh yeah, that's apparently another remedy for this. Ugh. It didn't help because he died a few months later. Throughout the 18th and 19th century, you find a few vampire scares in New England. There are two theories about where the idea came from. The first is that they adopted superstitions from the Hessians, German mercenaries who fought for King George during the American Revolution. So in New England, 
they had the chewy vampire, not the blood sucky one. So there were those Nazeras. Another theory claims that these are Romanian vampires, evidenced by the blood in the mouth, the burning of the heart, and giving the ashes to the sick person. These are the signs of Romanian vampires afoot. Either the melting pot of America applies to the undead, or we have a mixing of folklores here. This was long past the heyday of the vampire. In the mid-18th century, Pope Benedict XIV declared vampires were fallacious fictions of human fantasy. While the vampire panics occurred in New England, we had books in Europe like The Vampire, Camilla, and Dracula on the bookshelves. These vampires drew from folklore, but were the beginnings of the sexy, aristocratic vampires we think of today. In the 20th century, vampire scares all but disappeared. One notable exception was in the 1960s, when the president of the British Occult Society, Sean Manchester, claimed the vampire was causing mischief in a London cemetery. Journalists picked up the story with glee, and it became a media phenomenon. In 1970, Manchester told the press he was going to exorcise a vampire on a Friday the 13th. Hundreds of people turned up at the Highgate Cemetery to see it. Surprised though, he wound up not doing it. This vampire scare was recent and has more in common with, say, the scary clown scare than their old counterparts. Hype man. It's a powerful drug. After the big novels I mentioned in the 19th century, vampires began a new life in pop culture. The most famous one would be Bram Stoker's 1897 book, Dracula. He based his vampire on the old Roman prince Vlad Tepes, or Vlad the Impaler. Many of us in the West consider Vlad the Impaler a model for vampire lore, but many Romanians see him as a national hero. He ruled during a time when Romania was under threat from the Ottoman Empire and he tried to defend Romania, then called Wallachia, from them. Often he impaled Turks he captured and put them on display. They did this in a way that kept the victims alive for several hours. Grizzly, but not supernatural. Eastern European history, bloody stuff. Of course, real animals out there also drink blood. We have everyone's favorite blood-sucking worm, the leech, blood-sucking fish called lampreys, and who can forget the adorable vampire bat. However, Unlike vampire lore, these animals need to keep their host alive to produce more blood. Killing them isn't in their interest. And today, there are people who call themselves vampires and practice a sort of blood-sucking subculture. They dress in gothic styles and perform bloodletting rituals after they show clean blood work. They also don't bite the victim, but cut a fleshy part of the body with sterilized instruments by a trained medical practitioner. By the way, folks, don't drink blood. It might seem fun, but blood has a lot of iron in it, enough to cause problems with your liver and nervous system. Drinking blood can also spread bloodborne diseases like HIV. It's just not the best idea. What makes the vampire a special creature is that they can take so many forms, from blade to twilight. There's just so much lore to draw upon. No attribute of a vampire is universal to all vampires, and so you can shape the monster to fit any number of stories. It's a rich folklore that's still growing and evolving today, so have fun with it. <laughs> this video is part of a collaboration with the WeCreate EDU community. A bunch of educational YouTubers have made Halloween-themed videos today and you can watch them all in the playlist down in the description. Now, to give you the real ways to stop a vampire. First, vampires hate history. So if you click on the subscription box and click the bell notification, vampires will sense you're onto them and avoid you. I can attest to this. Not a single step back subscriber has been killed by a vampire. The best way to avoid a vampire's fangs, however, is to support Step Back on Patreon, like all of these verified humans. I'd especially like to thank Don and Carrie Johnson for their vampire protection. Just a heads up, next week Step Back will come out on Friday rather than Thursday. Rest in peace for now, but reanimate next week for more Step Back. <sighs> it still has the cardboard on it. This is all great. I need scissors. Do we have, do we have scissors? <laughs> you need scissors for the end here. Yeah. Thanks, YouTube, for your official um, providing the equipment for making. All right, let's, let's see what this, this tastes like. It tastes exactly what you would think that cherry syrup tastes like. Mmm. Wait, wait, wait. Ah. Mmm. 
Uh, these are gummy. These gummy fang things are like literally putting sugar on your teeth. They're all right though.